This is Joseph Coco. I'm at ALA 2015, the annual conference, on behalf of Becca Hilburn's Art Process blog, Keep on Trucking Nato Street. If you could introduce yourself, Becca. Hi, I'm Becca Hilburn, the creator of the blog, Keep on Trucking Nato Soup. Uh, okay. I'm a kids' media artist who specializes in comics that feature believable female heroines. And what's bringing you to ALA this year? Um, well, do you want the truth or do you want the nice answer? Either one's fine. Okay. Um, the nice answer is a lot of other creators told me this is a good show and that I ought to do it, especially if I'm looking to get my books in the libraries. The true answer is I'm self-published and that puts me 100% in charge of every single thing that happens or comes out of the studio. So I have to um, be really pushy about making sure I'm at events that could lead to other opportunities. Sure. And you came here mostly to promote Seven Inch Kara, correct? I did. Um, I had hoped to have the book I was I'm illustrating freelance finished, but we had some unfortunate delays. So um, I have some promotional material for it, and I have the originals behind the table with me, but I don't have um, the book yet. Right, and that's Gizmo Granny, correct? Yeah, it's that's right. It's a children's book. Yep. Uh, it's a children's novel written by Lenore Salazar and illustrated by me. It's going to have watercolor illustrations. Okay, and how long have you been working on that? About two years now, steadily. Um, shortly after I moved to um, Nashville, Tennessee, I got really cracking on it. All right, and what was your experience? Is this the first time you've worked with um, an author? I know Seven Inch Kara is uh, both written and illustrated by yourself, correct? Um, yeah, it is the first time I've worked with an author, and I think this is her first time working with an illustrator, so it was a learning experience for both of us. Okay, and can you tell us uh, just a little bit about Seven Inch Kara? I imagine most of your audience is fairly familiar with it. Um, uh, maybe you would, you would think that, and then every now and then I say something on Twitter, and people are like, oh, you do comics? <laughs> and like, it just blows my mind. Um, Seven Inch Kara is an all watercolor comic um, aimed at kids from kindergarten to sixth grade. I wanted to create a comic that kids could enjoy together with their parents, sort of in the tradition of like um, traditional children's books, like The Secret Garden or um, The Borrowers or The Indian in the Cover, um, which is also why I chose to do it in watercolor. I wanted to do um, more elaborate illustrations for the comic. It's sort of an homage to my mom who um, didn't really uh, put comics in front of us when I was a kid. She was, but she definitely gave us a lot of really beautiful children's books to read and to look at. A lot of Kyle DeCott winners. Um, so I wanted okay. to create a comic that she, when she was a children's literacy teacher, would have felt comfortable introducing to the parents of her students as something they could read together. All right, and the first volume is out right now. Yeah, that's uh, right. It came out March two thousand fourteen. I want to say. You're working on the second volume. I just scanned over a couple of pages from chapter five. When can we expect that to launch? Um, I would like to have that out fall 2016. It's it's sort of like the freelancer's conundrum. When I have both, like a lot of paying work, it often takes priority to the passion project that kind of has to fund itself. Okay. Uh, and you're, like I said, you're doing everything yourself. Um, all the lettering, all the writing, all the... Um, coloring and penciling, uh, is that a route that you would advise uh, creators to pursue? You know, it wasn't my first, um, it wasn't necessarily my first choice. It was sort of um, something that was a necessity. Yeah. I, I went to art school and I didn't really strike the fancy of any of the editors they brought in. Not enough that they could see me working for them. So um, I had this need to make comics and I wasn't going to let that stop me. And the best way you can get better at something is through practice. So right. doing it all by yourself is definitely a lot of practice in a lot of fields. Okay. And um, what people tend to not focus, not understand about um, a creator owned project is you often don't have the access to someone who is in traditionally trained or has the background in being an editor you have your comic right. friends who are wonderful wonderful people and they can give you a lot of pointers but their their pointers are not necessarily going to be from the writing writing aspect of it um but more from the like this is how you should stage this scene uh this is how you should redraw that illustration it's not really working so um what's funny is what i'm getting a lot of complaints about right now are from uh, reviewers who feel like book one is they, they feel like it's just like the borrowers 
um, which is kind of the point of it. But okay. I think if I'd had an editor, I could have been able to accomplish setting the story up to seem like it's going to be very yeah. similar to The Borrowers you, without people... You could have had basically like insinuations or hype right. from other people uh, just right. reviewing that the book that had a little bit more insight into the story right. so they could say something about it and explain it without necessarily spoiling right, it. Right, right. That, that's been extremely difficult for me. I'm not really sure how to, yeah. how to tell people, yes, I set book up one to be like that on purpose so that book two and book three could be totally different and right. wipe away well, your you expectations. You only have so much time to pitch a book to That's right. A Most people will only give me a like a minute at best. Like at TCAF, I had um, people coming, oh, and TCAF, whole nother, whole nother story. <laughs> I was suffering. Toronto Comic and Arts I was suffering from heat exhaustion. I was actually really sick, as was everyone in the children's section, honestly. And I had people coming in fresh from like outside, or like they just got lunch, and they're like, "Give me your thirty-second pitch." And like, it, <laughs> I couldn't even get coherent sentences out, yeah, much let less alone give pitch my own book. A refined pitch, right? To someone. Yeah. Um, but so I've been working on um, improving my pitch at TCAF. Unfortunately, librarians and educators are much more patient with me than my own peers, uh, like pe creators my age, or um, other comic artists are sometimes. Sometimes, it, given how I was asked to give my pitch, I felt like they were doing like a one minute challenge rather than like actual interest in the book. Right. Uh, people who are really looking to be sold. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me uh, how librarians and just guests at ALA have responded to your book, uh, um, s specifically the subject matter and also the fact that it's self-published? Sure. Seals have been a little bit slow, but apparently that's fairly normal for um, the show and for the day. Um, they, it definitely helped when I put the portfolio out. I had trouble pe getting people to pick it up and look at it. Um, before I put the portfolio out, but having the portfolio out, it's big, it's colorful, it's originals. People seem to really respond to that. Sure. Um, I come from like an anime convention background, which is kind of like um, lots of cheap, sparkly things, one or two expensive things that you actually care about. So um, I had to lose that that anime kid mindset and right. think, try to think more like an adult and more how to to approach adults. Um, the ones who have stopped and looked at <laughs> I did, my, my I portfolio did. seem very receptive to it. They really like the fact that I'm trying to do a comic, or I am doing a comic, about a little girl who isn't just one thing. She's not a princess. She's not like the stereotypical girly girl. She's not just, she's not a tomboy, like in the traditional, I'm a tomboy and I'm only a tomboy sense that a lot of um, kids, books aimed at kids tend to portray tomboys right. she doesn't carry a gun she's a strong female protagonist in that she is her own person who makes decisions whether they're the right ones or the wrong ones based on information that she's gathered or that she's been told and she acts upon those decisions and then has to pay the consequences for what she's decided to do so have you had any parents who um, have read the book uh, or heard your pitch and basically said this character sounds very headstrong. I don't want my child emulating um, a headstrong character. No, and I think part of the part of why that hasn't been a problem yet is because I am I'm careful to mention that Kara does have to learn from her mistakes. Like I was a headstrong kid. I'm a headstrong woman, obviously. I'm self-publishing. You have to be headstrong, and sure. so headstrong isn't necessarily a flaw, but. What you have to really become, what you have to accept is that you will have to take responsibility for the actions of your, that come from your choices. Okay. And I think so that's something parents... it's not glamorizing No, it's not meant behavior. to be like, just go do what you want. Sure. You're your own person now. You're 11. You can make decisions. Well, it sounds like people have responded to it at the convention fairly well. Um, you do have a lot of other items on your table. I know that... You recently published a line of uh, wooden charms. Yeah, that's right. Um, my significant other helped me with those. I came up with the de designs, and he spent the weeks vectorizing them. And he's even written a post about his process, which is extremely generous of him because it's become very popular among conventioning artists to not share how they do what they do. And I, I personally think that's wrong. Um, so we're very happy to share that post with people. We are excited to see the wonderful things that they can make with the knowledge that he shared. 
Okay. And how have, um, I, know, I know you haven't had the charms at too many conventions, and you've only been offering the Kara charms for free at two conventions, but how have people responded to getting free wooden charms along with the uh, um, children's comics? Even though I display that they're for free, people often seem kind of surprised when I'm like, and you get a charm, and then they're really excited. Okay. Um, which brings me to another thing. A, a lot of librarians at ALA uh, Annual are looking for handouts, basically. That's not to say they're not going to spend their money. Right. But well, um, well there ALA, is a, a big outside of the Artist Alley, is very much set up to providing samples, to providing right. freebies. Right. I mean, they gave some us of the products here are incredibly expensive, and it's unreasonable to just ask someone to purchase them without uh, allowing them to test it at first. So I think. Um, some oh, of the larger oh, yeah, companies. Yeah. When you say here, you don't the, mean the artist right, alley. The artist That's why alley. I was at making the, a face. I was like, at the entire convention. I think most of us in the artist alley are pricing ourselves reasonably for what we're offering. Sure, but there's thousands of dollars right. of merchandise right, here, right, right, and right, people right, need right, some right, sort right. of There's a, a lot of like library subscription, subscription <laughs> services. <laughs> sure. Right. Gotcha. Um, so, how have people been responding to um, the majority of your table being? products for purchase a, maybe with a, a few takeaways have tried to like um take the book as a sample or they've tried to take one of the pouches on the side as a sample despite there being a price tag um and i just have to rum i just have to be like that'll be six dollars please and they usually are like oh i'm so sorry right um, when they understand you're just right. an artist and Trying can't afford to, to make a living yeah, yeah. Um, but I do have some takeaways on the table. Um, I have the two postcards, the seven inch Kara one, which features um, the painting I did to as my submission into ALA, and that's available in the art auction right now. It's watercolor on Canson paper. Okay. Um, it's eight inches by 10 inches. It actually turned out really, really cute, I think. I'm really pleased with it. Definitely. And I also have the Gizmo Granny postcard. Um, just as a way to promote the book and there's a description on the back the tagline since um, she's the writer isn't here to pitch the book herself sure um, and I also have my business cards and for people who like spend a significant amount of time looking at or talking to me about Kara I have um, these cute little memo pads I have the ISBN hopefully they'll check it out later on if they didn't want to check it out at the show I can understand how overwhelming the show is. This shows over like two big convention center areas. Okay, and um, how did you, uh, you said you were advised to come to ALA from other artists. How did you go about researching the convention? I know you spent a I actually a had a lot of, of trouble. Um, first of all, most of the artists who said, yeah, you should come, didn't really provide me with any tips or help. One caveat is uh, Jersey Droid. Uh, I met him at TCAF and he provided a lot of very useful suggestions. I really appreciate that. Thank you for being so open with sharing information like that. I know some people sure. are not, they, they feel like that's bad business to help other artists. So thank you, Jersey, for being yeah, so generous. He does. We actually interviewed him about all the outreach he does as well as his right, comics. Um, right. And he TCAF. also does um, two podcasts that are, right? Is it two or is it three? It's more like four or five. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I, I, well, I currently consume two and I support his Patreon. Sure. But uh, there's only, I only have so many free hours that I can consume media. Okay, so you had trouble getting information from individuals who I did. came to the show. So <laughs> right. how did you ultimately find out about uh, um, just how to prepare for the convention and if it might be a good fit for you? You know, I, I when I can't get a straight answer out of people about a show, I have a um, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks approach. Okay. Um, so the table was set up very differently yesterday. I had some mini comics out because I thought librarians might be interested in that since there's like a zine area just over there sure. and nobody was picking them up, which is fine. So I cleared them off the table and I rearranged all of my tabletop stuff so I could put my portfolio out and um, that's helped a lot. So really what I think is important if you're going to do a variety of shows is to be prepared to just change things at the drop of a hat and unfortunately that means packing a lot of stuff and maybe not using a lot of the stuff you pack or not being able to sell a lot of the stuff you brought that you thought would work and just doesn't yeah but it's better to um, be able to be flexible and make changes rather than being stubborn and suffer for it and that's how I feel I get very frustrated um, by um, bad situations 
that right. I have no ability to, to try and change for the better. Right. So instead of spiraling downward, you prefer to have the ability to, to fight as much yeah. as I can. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so how uh, we discussed how librarians and other attendees in the convention are responding to your book. Um, what about uh, your other products? We mentioned the wooden charms, and you also have sassy buttons um, here and bookmarks. The sassy buttons have been moving Original okay. Original artwork, that They're, sort of thing. Um, special book lover slash librarian sassy buttons. Oh, sorry. Um, the travel is knocking one of my gems loose. Mm -hmm. um, those those sort of buttons sell very well at anime cons. They sold really well at Free Comic Book Day. They sold really well at TCAF. Like to the point where it's really kind of getting on my nerves because they're my best they're my best seller, okay. right? <laughs> rather than my comic, which right, any which comic is... artist would rather that be their best seller. Um, so it's kind of nice that people are like, oh, that's cool, and then they're looking at the comic instead. Like it warms my heart. Yeah. Rather than the shiny, bright, anime esque stuff being like the sole so reason they're here. It's not as important to have extras on your table that aren't giveaways basically at AOA as it would be at say an anime con or maybe even an indie comic con. Okay, all right. So the thing about an anime con is like Momocon, for example, had a um, a comic alley, um, and to be in that comic alley, the only things you could sell are things directly related to your comic. So sure. your comics, the originals. Charms Some charms, maybe, maybe they seemed kind of iffy about allowing that kind of stuff. To be honest, because huh. I I'd, I'd poked them about it, and they're like, oh, I don't know. Um, and the problem with that is with anime cons, with anime fans. Um, first, a lot of them are now used to consuming scanlations, so or and web comics, so they feel like comics should be free for them. They should have right. all of the and access. They'll maybe pay for merchandise. Right, right, basically. right. They're more likely to buy like um, charms or stickers, t-shirts, if they're a big fan of it. If it's something that they are yeah. already very connected to, so selling something they've never read before is kind of hard. Um, and I've been really fortunate. I usually average five books a convent of uh, anime con, which is good. For me, especially because they're fifteen dollar books, and most of these kids, I'm not kidding, they get twenty bucks for the day, and they gotta buy lunch with that twenty bucks. So the fact that they're spending the bulk of that little bit of money on um, something of mine that yeah. they've never read before, just you know, is so touching. But um, it's just not the biggest seller. I always make room for it on my table, sure. but it doesn't mean I'm because gonna. It's, it's important. That yeah, it's for you to make a living. That's that where my see. heart is, yeah. and honestly, other artists sometimes treat me really poorly. Because I do have to do, because we live, I live in the South, and there aren't any indie cons of any size in the South. So I have to pay out the wazoo to even attend an indie show. Right. So I do do a lot of anime cons because I can make money at them. Um, and a lot of. Tables are also kind of expensive at a lot of those that's shows. That's right. They're like, um, an indie con table would be like 300 for a half. Um, whereas at an anime show, um, it's like 150 for six to eight feet. You get double the space for half the price. Yeah. Um, and I make more than double the amount of money because uh -huh. I sell a lot of commissions, I sell a lot of watercolors, I sell a lot of charms and buttons and stickers. <laughs> like I'm making sales the whole show. At okay. an IndieCon or at ALA, there's a lot of downtime where okay. I'm just like, yeah. So uh, have commissions been selling at ALA No. Well, so you have a little bit of table yeah, space devoted to it. Yeah. Um, no, and I'm okay with that, honestly. Um, it would be cool to draw, especially like people's kids or their pets. I love doing that. Or drawing yeah. them. I like drawing people, like attendees as well. Um, I also like drawing OCs. Basically anything that's like personal to the person commissioning me. Um, I love to draw for them. But like generic fan art is not really my favorite thing to draw unless we both really love it and then I'm super into it as well. Um, okay. So I'm kind of okay with that. Honestly, I was really afraid that some librarians would see the $5 sketch thing and be like, hey, can you draw this character from their favorite book that I don't know anything about? And I'm yeah. just like, can you describe them to me? <laughs> so I'm well, kind of relieved. There is internet access. In yeah, I know, center, so. but that requires finding a description in the book that I might not have access to right. that is a accurate portrayal of the character they want so I'm, I'm relieved I mean it would have been a fun challenge yeah but I'm relieved especially because people with the written descriptions people have a very specific image of what that character looks like um, like for example a lot of people myself included when we read Harry Potter we definitely thought Hermione Granger was African well we thought she was African um, British or like Haitian 
you know? Right. And then they cast Emma well, Watson, it's, and it's like, that's not how I saw her. It's also about the artist's interpretation of the character, I'm Right, sure. but I know some people take the Their character description very little, personally. Yeah. It has a lot of meaning to them, and I would hate to, to, to spend the time yeah. drawing how I think they look, and then the person's really disappointed with it. That's okay. killer. Well, I mentioned that AOA Annual is a massive conference, and Artist Alley is only a small portion of that. That's right. There's also associated things like the gaming pavilion. Yeah. And the um, there's like a gaming and comic stage novel, just over there. The graphic novel pavilion. But how many um, attendees of ALA uh, ALA do you think are actually coming over to the um, Artist Alley, Alley area? What's traffic flow been like? A very, in general? I think a very small portion of the whole are making it over here, which is which is okay because this con is a, a convention. The show, sorry, is such a massive show. It would be unreasonable. <laughs> for them to even handle that many people down here. Sure. Um, I'm really hoping the kind of people who wander down the artist alley are the kind of people who are really into buying um, original stuff art or from art the from artist from alley. Creators. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, because otherwise, a lot of the books they could be buying, they could buy it from this, this booth, which is here, or the first, second booth, they're here too. And I know they're having some of their artists come in as well. So like, right? Does that make sense? Sure. So, um, like, I hope can, they're prepared to buy, is what yeah. I'm saying. Uh, certainly people are here for lots of things, but if they're coming to the Artist Alley specifically, they, they should have an idea of, of what it's like here. Right, right. Um, so, where can we find information uh, on when the next 7-inch Care is going to be released and uh, when Gizmo Grand is going to be released? Um, I, believe it or not, I actually do write about it on my blog. Okay. Despite the fact that people only read it for marker reviews, um, <laughs> and that's natasoup.blogspot.com. I also post my pages in progress to my Instagram and my Tumblr. Both of those are also natasoup slash insert website name here. Right, and you're I natasoup everywhere. That's right. I got a lockdown on it. People complain about the name. They're like, Nato's disgusting. But hey, <laughs> I am the only person with that name, and it sticks in their heads. So maybe that's a good thing. Um, I also tweet about it. I post photos of my pages on Twitter as well. Like pretty much anytime. So most social networks. Yeah. Anytime I'm working on a project, I'm definitely trying to share it with people. There's, it shouldn't be a huge mystery. Okay. And um, Seven Inch Kara is your main project uh, right now. Uh, Gizmo Granny should be coming out soon. That's so right. The majority of fall 2015. Um, but uh, you have also worked on a couple of anthologies. Uh, I have. I have a couple of them in my miniature library, sure. as well as a copy of The Search for Catbug, which I did a watercolor spread for. Um, feel free to look through those. I have them, my pages bookmarked. Okay. Um, and I'm also in two anthologies that aren't shown there uh, because they haven't come out yet. Chainmail Bikini, which is a gaming anthology about female experiences with and tabletop gaming. And um, 1001 Nights, which is a lady night anthology organized by um, Kevin J. Stanton and Annie Stoll. Who right. I've worked with Annie before. I like Annie a lot. Um, and Kevin seems great. I haven't. This is my first time working with him. He's been very pleasant. I'm excited to see how the book looks. They keep. Um, they're so nice. They keep postponing the deadline for the other artists, which has been a little frustrating because I like moved heaven and earth to have my pages done by the deadline they gave me. Right, so the Kickstarter for that hasn't launched no, yet, correct? No, it hasn't. So where can And Chainmail Bikini has already been successfully funded. So. Right, so we wouldn't be able to get our hands on Chainmail Bikini um, unless we knew someone? Mm, or it's going to be available in some of the individual creator stores? You know, I... They weren't really all that clear okay. about it. Well, um, which is like kind of common about anthologies. I'm sure. pretty sure I'm going to be. Ha I'm going to have copies. I'm pretty sure that that's one of the. Way they're paying us a couple ways, and I'm pretty sure books is one of them. Um, I would super appreciate it. Anyone who's watching this, who's interested in that anthology, to please buy it from me because I had a really hard time moving Hannah Doki because everybody who wanted Hannah Doki bought it at TCAF, and I couldn't be there for their debut. Being a Southern artist, I have to pick my indie cons carefully. I often don't get to make it to the launch party. Okay. People kind and of forget I exist. So it would mean a lot store. to me. Yeah, oh, and At I'll definitely promote the heck out of having it. Okay. So people will know. Yeah, they're from um, social networks. And um, anytime and you buy something from my store, it really does help 
I try to do a lot of comic outreach, a lot of comic community building. Um, so the financial support enables me to do that because it takes time away from me doing freelance art or watercolors for quick sale. You know, like sure. it takes a lot of time out of that. So the financial support would be really great. I okay. hate having to ask like this, but I think we're at that point now, <laughs> okay, where fine. I've been I've been very and subtle about it for five years. A thousand and one nights. And people don't even know I make comics. A thousand apparently. and one nights should be coming out in a couple of months on Kickstarter. I would like to think so, but okay. like they're still shaking people down for some of their submissions, and I know okay. life happens. Believe well, me, I lost my it. dad. I know life happens. We should see it on Kickstarter in the near future, though, right? I don't know. Okay. I would really like to think so. <laughs> they, they were like um, doing an all call in New York for artists who lived in the area to come be part of the video. Okay. Um, and you're working that as a full color six Oh, no, I could show page. you. I have, um, gee, I had it on my chair back here and then it got moved. Here I thought they didn't want you showing pages until after the Kickstarter announcement. <laughs> keep postponing in the release yeah sure and these aren't full pages because right, the, text the text isn't there okay and i've edited the, the pages to Digitally. read better yeah. yeah like a lot of work has actually been put into making the pages mastered for the final book right certainly with all the characters on the page i imagine that you did some touch-ups to try to differentiate uh characters um, between each other i worked really hard from the very start to make sure everybody looked different and I also wanted to include um, a variety of ethnicities in there because I feel like representation is really really important so um, there's um, a Hispanic little girl and there's a couple of African little girls and the grandmother knight who's teaching them they're her granddaughters um, and there's a Korean little girl and there's a Chinese little girl so, um, oh, and two Indi Indian twins. Okay. That's great. Yeah, and I know um, in Seven Inch Care, it was important to you to uh, cast a at least slightly diverse audience, as, as diverse as you could within the Lilliputian world, basically. Oh, um, the Lilliputian world has a fair amount of diversity, and I hopefully can show you guys that in book three, where okay. um, her family comes to visit. Right. Um, and would you have... Um, any recommendations? Oh, and this is, um, these are pages from Chainmail Bikini, since we were just talking about that. Right, which My was recently kickstarted. Right, yeah, I did um, a faux ink wash, so it's actually black watercolor, which worked out really well as a faux ink wash. And the main character's name is Critical Missy, and all of her, um, she is played as a paladin, but she was rolled as a mage. Uh, would you have any advice to artists who are considering, or writers who are considering uh, attending ALA in the Artist Alley for the first time? Writers? Writers or, writers or artists? Um, for writers, I would say bring your artist. Okay. I have a lot of writer friends who have trouble selling at cons when they go by themselves. Sure. Um, it might be hard for them to talk about the art process because they're, they're, they're writers, so they can talk about that, but the art process tends to be what's glamorized. Right. Um, so bring your artist if you can. Um, or at least bring their portfolio and be able to talk about their process would probably be good advice yep. um, for and general. We gave some general advice throughout the entire uh, interview for artists, but um, any any takeaways we didn't mention? Um, gee, I'm still I've learned a lot at this at this show. Sure. Um, I know that was sounded like a question, but I've been doing conventions almost non-stop for five years now so sometimes I feel like I and you can never like learn everything but sometimes I'm like I should really like know this I've got my game ready I'm good to go and then you hit a con where everything is different yeah. and uh, there's just no way you could have known because the information isn't necessarily available um, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more tips on your blog post when you do. Oh a yeah, 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 recap. yeah, yeah. I'm definitely gonna write about it. You do convention recaps for pretty much every convention. Every convention. You go to. Yep. Yeah. Even the bad ones. Even the good ones. And that's at natosoup.blogspot.com. That's right. And I also co-run a um, with Kiriska and Heidi Black. I co-run. Oh, and Satria. I co-run a um, how to Tumblr. do conventions Tumblr. Right. Sure. Um, how to be a con artist. You wouldn't believe how many people like they, that pun is just like. They don't realize that's on purpose, and they're like, you should have picked a better title. Yeah. But it's catchy, right? People remember it, right? Um, it's how to be a con artist at tumblr.com, uh, and I reblog my con recaps there, and we also answer questions 
So if you have a direct question about TCAF that you'd like to ask me, that you feel like I could answer for you, I would love to help you. Um, okay. TCAF I kind of- you mean ALA or TCAF? You're right, I'm so sorry. It's I'm, fine, it's, ALA it's, annual. Yeah, that's um, right. Um, something you should know is that ALA is not in San Francisco every year. It rotates cities. I've heard that it's going to be in New Orleans in the foreseeable future. I will definitely try to hit it up when it's in my stomping grounds, <laughs> simply because I can act, simply because I could actually save a lot of money. Yeah, and I mean that was like the big travel. thing. Like, um, it's been a pleasure to talk about Kara with people who actually seem to care, and it's been really nice to talk about Kara to people who like get how important it is to have a variety of female protagonists in media and who are very comics friendly. Like that's been great. But um, in terms of like a financial decision, um, yeah. MTAC was a much better financial decision. But you shouldn't attend ALA necessarily as just a financial de decision, especially if you're self-published. And you don't have a publisher who can provide uh, a little additional credibility to your name, who can get you interviews with like prominent comics journalists, who's having their name attached to your name makes you more makes you attractive. more important yeah. right more attractive um so this is one of the shows you might want to consider doing especially if you're doing kids media yeah um, when you're hoping for a break basically right. and have a little bit when of you're trying to, to make spare. it happen for yourself yeah right okay well i appreciate all of your advice um i hope you have a good ala i hope so too thank you